Give thanks to God and call upon his name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Seek God's presence and God's strength. Let us worship our God, for our God is faithful. Let us pray. We pray, O God, that your spirit would guide and inspire our worship. Open our mouth to speak your praise. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see you at work among us. And open our hearts to receive your love. For we pray in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. We pray in silence, remembering the family of Roy McBurney. 
the people of Highland Park, Illinois, Alan Dorn, Carol Langloy, Riley Stone, Penny Putnam, Bill Young, Joyce Teal, Cody Pound, George Gray, Lori Ayat, Pastor Hazard, Cindy D'Andrea, Judy Zuliani, Carolyn Montague, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, living with a rare blood disorder, and their parents, and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children. The people of Ukraine, Afghanistan, Haiti, and Cuba, all service women and service men, all who are afflicted with and by the virus, all innocents caught up in war, all God's creatures, great and small. Creator God, we come to you and approach your throne of grace as creatures of your kingdom. We find in you the source of life, the fount of all blessings, the wellspring of goodness, which you offer for our sustenance and our nourishment, both physical and spiritual. Seeing in you, O God, the ground of our being, we seek your continuing comfort and your never-ending care for our lives, that we might live in the light of your beauty as we repose under the shadow of your wing. O Lord most loving, we acknowledge that we have not loved as you have taught us to love, and that we have not always reflected your willingness to forgive others their trespasses. We pray, O Lord of love, that you will not deal with us harshly, even as we pray for your correction of our lives. Teach us, O Lord, to live in such a way that others will see evidence that Jesus is alive today, directing us in a pilgrimage of peace and leading us in paths of righteousness so that we might exemplify what is truly worthy of your will for your creation. Lord of the universe, we are thankful that you have gathered us together in community, sharing your goodness and calling others to your side. Strengthen us, O God, as we endeavor to build a faithful congregation in this place, that we might be a light to all who are lost, in despair, or languishing in pain. Almighty One, we pray not only for ourselves, and not just for others like us, but for all whom you love, knowing that each and every one of your children is created in the divine image. May the spirit of the carpenter of Nazareth, who labored his entire life for the good of others, flourish in our own lives as we expend righteous efforts in hastening the coming of your kingdom here on earth. May our works bear good fruit, worthy of Christ's sacrifice, given so freely and offered so nobly, even in the face of evil. May our lives reflect his beauty, and may our strivings be worthy of his heavenly grace, so freely offered to all so generously, that everyone might be transformed by adhering to his ideals and partaking of his perfection. For we pray in the name of your Son. Amen.
Our scripture lesson for this morning come, comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 5 through 14. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, though I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life, no other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem, where he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, he offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being and provided a feast for all his servants. Here end the morning scripture lessons.
As many of you know, I used to teach at Hartford Seminary. And one of the courses that I taught and that in, I enjoyed very much was called Major Themes of Scripture. And I taught that course for any number of years. Because the semester was limited to 13 or 14 weeks, I only had about 10 major themes that I could uh, treat within any uh, given semester. And so that, of course, artificially limited uh, the, um, the amount of ground that I could cover. And as a result, one of the major themes of scripture that I did not cover is the subject of today's sermon, the title of which is Wisdom. When scriptures talk about wisdom, they usually tell a story. For example, there's Joseph, who served Pharaoh by storing up grain during seven years of plenty in order to get through seven subsequent years of famine. But how did Joseph become wise? In Pharaoh's own words, the Spirit of God was found within Joseph and thus was a Hebrew slave able to serve Pharaoh's people, the very people who had enslaved the Hebrews. Now, the person in the Bible best known for wisdom was not Joseph, but was King Solomon, who lived hundreds of years after Joseph. Solomon was the son of King David, and Solomon's reign arguably got off to a pretty good start. And how was that good start achieved? Not through any earthly qualities in Solomon, but it came in answer to a prayer that Solomon made soon after he became king. We heard part of that prayer this morning when the new king addressed God saying, give thy servant an understanding mind to govern thy people that I may discern between good and evil. Discerning between good and evil is wisdom itself. God granted Solomon's request, but if you know the story of his reign, Solomon ultimately decided to forsake wisdom in favor of other less important, less eternal pursuits. A third character in the Hebrew Bible associated with wisdom is Daniel, who lived hundreds of years after Solomon. His story is a little like Joseph's, in that Daniel, objectively speaking, is a loser. His people have been overrun by the Babylonians and are sent into exile. But when the powers that be who had subjugated God's people discovered that they were incapable of solving their own problems, because they relied exclusively upon themselves, they discovered among the captive nation of Judah a source of untapped wisdom in the person of Daniel. The king of Babylon needed a dream interpreted, and the so-called experts of the day were incapable of doing the job. The story of Daniel tells us that wisdom reveals mysteries that knowledge, mere knowledge, cannot fathom. But how is such wisdom acquired? Intelligence does not guarantee wisdom. Neither will subscribing to some Wall Street newsletter or by pursuing political empowerment. Scripture, however, affirms that wisdom is all around us. It stands in the middle of our everyday lives, calling out for us, if only we would heed the call. Wisdom is available, but by divine invitation only. Yet so many ignore that truth and doubt the very reality of the divine in their own lives. Many search for wisdom, but in their confusion look for it, as it says in the book of Job, in the land of the living, in the accepted ways, in what some call tradition. Others think that certain manners of behavior, such as attending the right church or volunteering for politically correct causes, will provide the keys to wisdom. But trying to find wisdom in such a way is like the man who wanted to be smart. And so he bought himself a set of encyclopedias, thinking that if he physically owned or possessed a repository of knowledge, and could show a sales receipt for it, 
he would be considered knowledgeable. However, wisdom is not knowledge, and it certainly is not for sale. Wisdom is beyond the dimension of scholarly endeavor. It is not a matter of acquiring facts or getting good grades. We cannot dig it up from the ground like a precious metal or plant it and water it and then harvest it. On the contrary, wisdom must come from an encounter with the holy. For wisdom is something beyond ordinary thought, ordinary knowledge, ordinary living. And it is in this encounter with the creator of life, with the one who loves us, that wisdom first comes to us. Now, why should that be? In experiencing the great infinite majesty and power of God, we inevitably come to a sense of our limits. And to learn acceptance of those limits is one of the first steps in acquiring wisdom. To learn that we are not the center of the universe and that in the end, what we want, what we think, what we do, is not the most important game in town. So just as we mature physically and socially, we must mature spiritually. And through spiritual maturity, wisdom becomes the gift of God. I suspect that most of us here, having attained the age of six or seven, realize that we are not the end-all and be-all of life, the universe, and everything. And before the age of six, well, we have an excuse for thinking that everything revolves around us, especially if we have been brought up in a home that, yes, has perhaps indulged us a little. But growing old is not always the same as growing up. Sometimes we can get a little confused. Some people think that if they have street smarts or have devised successful schemes to beat the system, they will have made it, as the saying goes. But much more important than all the stress and toil and striving and anxiety that go into assuring that we ourselves are comfortable, even if our neighbors are not, is the realization that comes to the writer of the book of Proverbs who tells anyone who will listen that it is the fear of God where wisdom is encountered. That must come first. It is the fear of God which is the beginning of wisdom. And that means that acquiring wisdom is not always easy. It may be simple, but not easy, because it's not always easy to put God first. The greatest wisdom, of course, is needed where life is often the most painful. When we are confronted by our failures, our mistakes, our guilt. It is then that we especially need to look in faith to the one whom Jesus calls Father, the one who is eternal, who has promised that ultimately nothing can separate us from him. And in his love for us, our faith meets divine wisdom. Indeed, for those who look to him and receive him, faith and wisdom become one. Thanks be to God for such an unspeakable gift. Amen.
May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.